Uh, sure. You mean the methodology that you described uh, in in your emails some time ago? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the, the odd thing about this is it involves human cultures and uh, the subjects of investigations also vary, of course, uh, from extremely complex to the point of being too complex for most journalists even to comprehend to extremely simple. So it's hard to come up with a um, one size fits all methodology for any investigation. So but it, with that with that caveat, uh, I think, you know, any attempt is exciting and path breaking by itself. So um, I think it's, it's such a relatively new th phenomenon still in the history of journalism that some degree of humility and modesty and um, humility, I think, is necessary. So that's where I would come down. Uh, in your experiences, um, which would be the, the must having, whether it's a methodology, a workflow, or a suggested, um, you know, steps? What are the, the main lessons that say, well, you need to consider these things? You know, I wanted to tell you that what you're thinking about and trying to do here um, as a, both as a journalist and as an academic is actually unusual. Um, most journalists are very good at doing. They're not very good at, at uh, chronicling what they've done or how they did it. The methodology part of it is always seat of the pants, as you know, and kind of helter skelter, kind of uh, uh, frenetic. and and um, disorganized, essentially. And so um, uh, I guess what I'm getting at is uh, what you're doing is a very, very useful thing because the, as you noted yourself, I think there's very little literature about the methodology for collaborations by large numbers of journalists across borders. It's actually extremely new field um, really in just the last few years in humankind. Um, it, it's really an astonishing thing that's happened historically, but there's very little literature. You're, you're, you're uh, groundbreaking in what you're attempting by itself. You should just know that. So the answer to your question is not a simple one because in part, no one has agreed on what those principles or what the common mores are for how do you proceed. And that's a problem. That's a problem, and it's an exciting opportunity. I would favor the latter if I were you, <laughs> but um, I do think that's relevant to how you look at this because a, there's no one perfect way because people are different, situations are different, and it's very hard to create a cookie cutter for every single case. And b, there's nothing to compare it with, as far as I know. I'm not aware of anyone who has done uh, a sophisticated detailed systematic methodology for how one can do these things because every case and every story and every circumstance differs. So I, I'm not trying to make it sound impossible, but I also want you to be uh, to acknowledge from my experience, each case is so different. It's very there's a reason no one has done it before because it's hard to generalize about all reporting in the world on all potential subjects and have a one size fits all, you know, uh, thing. It doesn't mean it's not a lofty idea and that, that it's not needed. I think it is needed, but people are so busy, especially journalists doing what they do, that they don't ever think about being systematic about what they did and explaining it later. That's not how they think, as you know. And even editors are just worried about the deadline and what goes out tomorrow <laughs> or next week or whenever it is. So. There's this sort of a short attention span, to put it mildly, among all journalists at all levels. And for all those reasons, it is necessary for an academic to then explain it because journalists have never figured that out, or at least a lot. if they do figure it out, they'll see it as a competitive advantage and not tell anyone else. <laughs> well, yeah, which defeats the, pur the purpose of the collaboration. Right, I know. <laughs> it, it's just kind of silly. Uh, and sometimes, uh, methodologies are so complex, they have to toss them out and start all over. Uh, yes. And, and that, that has happened in the last few years. I, I did all these interviews with Latin American journalists who have said, all right, but what about who's going to manage the resources? Who is going to have the last editorial? The role of a coordinator is a coordinator of a director. So at the end of the day, who is guiding the editorial? So the methodology 
can be a way of helping manage that. Right. Uh, no, it, it's true. You know, the uh, my impression now in these last two, three years as collaborations have now entered into hundreds of people around planet Earth on a single subject, um, that uh, at least in my own experience with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, is, at the time that was created, there was almost no collaboration in the world, hardly across borders for investigative. Now they're doing collaborations with hundreds with an S on the back of journalists. And that's, to my knowledge, for investigative reporting, at least in my experience, un unprecedented. And what is happening is uh, when the publisher in that case has always been the platform that is ICIJ, those, as you're noting, the in, but I'm making it more specific, the director and the deputy director of the consortium decide everything pretty much. It's up to them about the standards, about who gets included, about what will be the parameters of the story, about what's in, what's out. And it is a kind of a, a bit of a top-down element to it. That doesn't mean that they don't uh, glom on to important information and expand the scope, which apparently is what's happening right now with the latest investigation, which will be the largest in the history of the world in the next few weeks. Um, but you still have someone, in my experience at least, also having to worry about libel and other little litigation related things. You have to, not just to mention safety, of course, there still has to be someone, it can't be completely kumbaya, uh, let's all, I mean, I'm telling you, you already like to do this and do it yourself, but uh, my experience is there has to be someone, somewhere and someone where the buck stops or the whatever you call it, the decision makes, gets made at the 11th hour, up, down, in, out, because um, otherwise you have some sort of uh, Woodstock film festival where everyone sings and everyone hangs out and everyone does drugs and it's a wonderful time, but what the hell is it? <laughs> and it'll be, they'll have, it's the old cliche by Winston Churchill, this, this pudding has no theme, mixing metaphors. It, so I do feel like there is a need for some editorial guidance at some point. I mean, at least my experience, it's yes. hard to do it without that. Um, well, I think uh, like everything in life and human affairs, it has experience has a lot to do with experience. What I mean is the interactions of, of humans. Basically, it's very hard to, to interact with people you don't know and make pretty important decisions. There has to be some degree of familiarity. And I, I uh, my experience is that um, the only way to deal with that is to, you can't foretell that and you can't predict it and you can't assume it. It does still come down to humans, at least for a few more years. And uh, I'm, I'm kidding, but uh, not entirely. Anyway, I, I do think that is a crucial, crucial element. and. Uh, I know that in my experiences, trust is everything, especially when you're dealing with human sources, because you're depending on another journalist to assure you that their source is ironclad and highly credible. And if you find out later that was not true, the whole house of cards could collapse based on one mistake like that, one. And it could also end up in a litigious mess or even a safety issue um, because of that. So the trust, these are in capital letters in bold face, trust, 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 right? And, and I think the reason a lot of journalists, and I su suspect my own experiences, I've, I've gravitated this way myself. I've, I'm, when I ran the Center for Public Integrity, we were known for documents and primary records, uh, which of course later then became data that was based on that kind of uh, solid sort of cement. It doesn't mean documents can't be phon phonied up or f forged or falsified, but generally speaking, they are not. And um, that that gives some foundation to the notion that there's something here with, with actual records, whether it's bank records, secret bank records, or it's whatever it is. And that does give a sense of trust, along with journalists who know that subject area inside out. The problem the problem with collaborations is I think journalism in general 
in every field of journalism, in every part of investigative journalism has become so highly specialized that uh, if you, you know, you have financial journalists now who, who are so arcanely specific and knowledgeable about their, not their financial field that they can't cover any other specified field because national security has its own little realm, as you know, and uh, corruption and organized crime has its little realm and every one of these little fields. So it's very hard to do a ge generic topic and getting lots of folks to just help out on it. You're increasingly, I find that investigative reporting is becoming highly, highly specialized in every one of these specific areas. And that's why you go to a conference with 150 panels now because that's how many specialized things and if you add in um 1200 people that just gathered in the u.s uh, for a, a data journalism conference and that's just one example of so many conferences around the world but th these numbers are getting really huge and the data journalists of the 80s and 90s can't talk today to the data journalists of 2016 because some are dealing with algorithms and all these other high technologies and others are still dealing with government records in the most primitive state uh, using computers, but not not all that deeply. And so the unevenness of professional talent and experience, and then of course add in things like language and culture barriers, and then of course media journalism uh, ethical standards or lack thereof, <laughs> um, you're dealing with quicksand. I mean, it's really dangerous. It's actually da physically dangerous. And it's in terms of litigation, it's it's precarious in the extreme, and uh, it's enough to give someone gray hair very quick quickly. Uh, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, do you see there is a, in the collaborations maybe um, generational differences that are you know particularly challenging? Well, uh, I think the only challenging generational part of it is probably the, the technologies that keep changing every three minutes. Um, and I remember when Chico Mendes died in the Brazilian Amazon and no one could film it for like three or four years. Everyone was waiting for the movie. That's back, as you know, as the World Wide Web was just starting to be created. And we only had the Internet, but not the web. And very few journalists had handheld uh, high eight cameras or what, whatever style camera. It was back in the infancy of all these technologies. But now the technologies have been exploding now for decades. And um, it's, it's, but you still have variations in technology. You also have variations in technological prowess by journalists. If you're collaborating with 5050 journalists around the world, and some of them just graduated from a typewriter and others are on their fifth smartphone and, and not to mention six other things, then you're dealing with, you have to, you know, I don't know if you heard about this, the International Consortium for one of the bank projects developed a database that was, uh, that took seven or eight months and lots of money. Let's not even think about how much money. Um, <laughs> and um, they figured out that it was too technically uh, extensive and elaborate and almost a labyrinth, uh, almost ridiculous way that no one could understand the database. They couldn't get into it. They, the, the, the center, ICIJ, had wasted, I, I'm guessing, over $100,000. I don't know how much exactly. They had to throw the whole thing out the window and start over. And another six to 12 months later, they had the same data organized in a more, um, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, easy to understand data set yeah. that others, all levels, highly proficient and not so proficient could comprehend. So the logistical encumbrances to investigate reporting without technology, without collaboration even, are substantial for one person. And that when you have several people with the gradations of all the things we're talking about, it's really a miracle when something really important gets published and it has no significant problems with it. I, I'm actually not kidding. Um, it's yeah. it's stunning. If we think about it, it's mir miraculous. There's no other word for it. And um, that's what makes it so exciting when it happens and it happens in a magnificent way and, and it's bulletproof in terms of credibility. No one can, can say a word about it. But it's also quite precarious because you also know all the time one little thing could go wrong and the whole thing, you're suddenly all smeared for being either idiots or 
having made a career ending mistake by some assumption you've made. I mean, I, I think it's quite, the stakes are quite high. When we talk about uh, cross-border journalism, we are basically focusing on data journalism. What happens when it's more, when it's not data journalism? I think that that's harder in a way. Uh, I actually, because uh, data journalism, everyone can look at the data and then take pieces out that affect their country or whatever their, their situation. The other kind, like you're investigating an organized crime situation, say the tobacco industry, uh, and you're looking at records that may be relevant around the world, like customs duties paid by different countries or the World Health Organization numbers that how that's how that story was broken, because one third of all the world's cigarettes were not being sold mysteriously. And of course, it was being smuggled in those situations. Um, you have to just. I'm, I'm sorry to make everything sound so complicated. <laughs> the fact is, it is. Um, and, um, you know, you also have the, the, the risk issues. Like, do you send a reporter into a dangerous place? Even if they say they can go and they are willing to go, the editor has the horrific decision. Should we want them to go? Isn't that dangerous no matter what they say? And is that responsible? And then the other part is, are we sure they know what the hell they're talking about and will they really do it? And then back to your morals and ethics stuff. When we ran, uh, when, when I ran the center and started the international consortium, we had to make a point that all ethics and all um, reporting standards had to be North American. It had to have at least two sources um, that no one was going to pay anyone for any money. You know, all the, the ethical standards that are predominantly at least we associate at least Americans do with North America or the US since that's where the libel litigation would be brought because the publisher publisher and the offices were in Washington it would have to have be based on those uh, standards and um, that sounds really basic but when you have a sort of kumbaya five continent investigation with journalists literally all over planet Earth um, they they may say they're all operating by the one standard, but most of them have never operated under that other standard. <laughs> and so how do you how do you ensure actually how do you actually know it's actually occurred? You you don't necessarily entirely. You can't. It's not humanly possible unless you go visit everyone's newsroom and check their phone records, <laughs> which I don't recommend. But I'm just saying you can lose sleep over what you don't know as a manager and as an editor, I think it's it's quite serious. Um, you know, having been sued by Russian billionaire oligarchs for a story about Dick Cheney and lived through a five year lawsuit, one of the biggest in the last 25 years in the US and being deposed uh, a deposition for two days uh, by fancy lawyers working for the Russian folks. Uh, I'm mindful of these things. <laughs> That doesn't mean it's not exciting and, and really thrilling what's happening. I don't mean to sound like I don't think that I do very much so. But I think, um, I mean, it's, it's a good news, bad, or the, I guess Dickens, the best of times, the worst of times with technologies and the increasing ability of journalists to use multiple technologies. That's thrilling. And the possibilities are, are multiplying every every day about what one can do with information. That's exciting. But we're still dealing with humans. <laughs> and humans still have their own quirks that are not necessarily um, predictable or, um, or uh, typical. They're quite atypical. We have lots of people who are different from each other and getting them to Collaborating, frankly, investigative reporters, excuse my language, are some of the biggest pains in the ass on planet Earth. I mean, they're they're by definition curmudgeonly sometimes, or at least stubborn, or disbelieving, or incredibly skeptical. And you know, it's basically it's a real challenge to get everyone to be on the same page, on the same story, on the same moment, even you know, and let alone agreeing with it. Um, and so. It is slightly amusing on one level, but it can be maddening also. We noticed it with the consortium. Uh, the older journalists are, uh, they have, we had 
folks that we, we call them the queen bees. Uh, queen, the queen bees and the worker bees. The queen bees were the most famous journalists who were at sort of the back end of their careers and their reputations were transcendent, uh, literally global global reputations in many cases. The problem was uh, uh, basically the old cliche about you can't teach a, an old dog new trips, tricks. They were so convinced that of their own uh, brilliance and their their own certitude about everything. They knew everything and uh, also on their subjects, whatever it was, even if it was not confined to their country, they were the expert. And so they they the folks who were older were calcified in their in their sort of rigidity about their views and not terribly open minded. And actually, the biggest problem of all when also they weren't all that anxious to work hard, they were a little bit working less, say, because they already had their career made and they were sort of, I wouldn't say coasting, but they were not, they had nothing to prove necessarily at that point. So you add all that together, so you're getting the prestige of their involvement, but not much else. <laughs> and then on the other side, you would have young uh, whippersnapper, really excited and aggressive, energetic journalists, who, young journalists who who um, might not have much experience, but they were extremely courageous, almost to a fault, maybe too too much so sometimes. And in terms of technology, they know they'd have everything that something that came out ten minutes ago. They would have it and know how to use it. And so you would have to. We used to our common co common uh, uh, refrain internally was you have to combine the worker bees and the queen bees together, um, and because often the queen bees will have judgment and experience that is useful, but not in every case. And if things involving any technology whatsoever, your your younger journalists are going to always know more and be on more of the edge about the technologies than the older journalists. And so you had to, it becomes a very, it's already complex enough because of language and culture and geography and expertise issues. But the other one is this, uh, I hate to use it, but a little bit of a generational slash uh, technology savvy, those kinds of considerations. And so this yet, these are just additional variables that really make it, um, uh, I, well, it, it's a reason that a lot of people haven't done this until recently. I think it, partly we're enabled by the technology. That's why we can all do this, why you and I can talk right now across the world with video and audio. But in addition to that, um, I think journalists increasingly know that the stories they want to do go beyond one person and they need to collaborate. That's all wonderful. Uh, the other thing is the old competitive news organizations that were arrogant beyond words, and frankly, many of them still are, um, that see the world through their own eyes and everyone else is chopped liver. Um, there's still a lot of that arrogance by the so-called elite or um, um, the different words for it, but you know what I mean, the, the bastions of uh, traditional journalism, shall we say. And even though they're now online, they still see themselves as the equivalent of Greek uh, columns, you know, um, and they are unwilling. Their arrogance is dripping and really offensive. I, I've always I've, I've always not enjoyed talking to any of those people to be very candid um, because they're so smug and full of themselves that they're, they're insufferable. Um, but occasionally you must work with them. <laughs> but yeah. but I, I find that the added, the arrogance and the attitude sometimes get on my nerves. And to get all these cats together, and it is hurting cats, it's probably not fair to cats. Um, it is really a challenge. Uh, it, it can't be overstated how hard it is. Well, no, I think in some cases that's the case, especially the, the folks who have sort of gravitated to books you know, and as a person who's written this, several books, I understand this phenomenon where you will disappear into the fade into the ether. You will be you will disappear from planet Earth into your subject and, yeah. and you, you get lost in your subject. And you also th then become an expert in, in the most arcane subject areas for a period of years. And then you come out almost like come out of the cave, proverbial cave and. You, you think you're an expert, but actually you've been missed the rest of the world <laughs> the last several years. And a lot of that's that's just trade off. You're getting someone who is and has still has numerous sources and is highly regarded, but is 
excuse my language, also a pain in the ass. And you have to juggle that with the young buck who is is arrogant beyond words and actually doesn't have any wisdom or any uh, scar tissue or any seasoning or experience. And you actually have to meld those talents all together. And you want to take the best of both. You want the, the high tech folks, the ones who are the, the worker bees are going to be the ones who are most rambunctious and aggressive and willing to take chances. And frankly, I hate to say it, but also put themselves in uh, delicate and even risky situations. The older journalists have already done that and they might be less inclined to do it. And they're also not as tech savvy, uh, but they also have judgment and lots of uh, wisdom about what has tra transcended the last few years and decades. That's context that is quite useful. And you have to meld all that into something that becomes solid and uh, covers everything simultaneously. And it is really an art form. And um, the consortium, uh, the International Consortium, has now done 25 cross-border investigations in the last 17 or so years, and or roughly 17 years. And um, now, of course, there's all there. There are many other networks, and I don't mean that's the only one, but that certainly one of the first ones. And now now you have several that are breaking down by subject areas. It's really thrilling to see the extensive um, subsets now in all kinds of fields and subjects of journalists across the world in various fields now, or, or uh, beat, I guess you'd call it, we, we used to call beat subjects, beat areas, environment, health. And so it's actually a thrilling time, but uh, it wasn't always as it, it's it, it's really makes everything I described look kind of quaint, like uh, discuss this, you know, discussing the dinosaur era of journalism or something. But because it's now changing so fast, you have subset genres of expertise across the world now that are starting to evolve. And uh, I actually think that's thrilling to watch and it's necessary. We we live in a peculiar world where journalism is defined by has historically been defined mostly by geography what city what country uh, and uh, the issues of our time around the world obviously transcend geography and um, and the beauty of the web I think and all the new technologies of say the last 20 years have allowed us to look more broadly for the first time that's also what's helped to disrupt uh, all the media companies and their bottom lines. But the other side of it editorially is I think it's the widen the aperture of the possible by all journalists. And that's thrilling by itself. And that's historic by itself. We've never had a a way to look at the world and then divide it into subsets and then have journalists across the world and any subject develop information about that subject. It's never happened before. Maybe think how new this is. It's really in the last 10 or 20 years of humankind. I mean, it's really an astonishing thing. And, you know, I, I teach international investigative reporting uh, at American University here. And I, uh, we were looking at timber, the timber industry and uh, the relationship with China and uh, certain parts of, of South America. And um, it, they're the biggest uh, importer of, of timber, I guess, from South America, I believe, and um, I know we were only looking at two or three countries, not the whole continent, but yeah. um, but I know that, so I was trying to think in part of what you wrote about the relationship between Australia and uh, Latin America and how you could relate those things. I mean, it's clear that there are powerful corporate interests that traffic in both places, I would say, but uh, the, the, well, the, mining, the mining industry. Mining is, is an obvious. And that's why pulling documents from different parts of the world are always fun because um, well, I think that's how we broke the tobacco smuggling story. The, the, the one third of the cigarettes in the world were not being sold. It didn't make sense. And it was actually South America where that story broke through. There were 10 journalists on six continents looking at uh, uh, tobacco uh, documents from British American tobacco. And there was a or some sort of uh, repository in uh, Guilford, England, and you had to get permission to go there. They were required by law because of all the tobacco litigation to present that, just as there's a, a similar place in the U.S. and Minnesota, different companies, Philip Morris, I think the other one is BAT. So they had to, if you wanted to go look at their documents, you had to make an appointment between like 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, three days a week or some silly thing. It was way out of 
outside London somewhere. And, and so one of the world's great journalists, Duncan Campbell, went there and the, he and the head of the International Consortium, Maud Bielman, had figured out that one third of the world's cigarettes were not being sold. And it made absolutely no sense. And of course, the, the industry, the tobacco industry, said they were trying to find out what was happening to their cigarettes, which of course is ludicrous. No one manufactures billions of extra cigarettes that aren't being sold year after year. So it, it, was, it did look awfully fishy, I guess you'd say, or whatever, very strange. So uh, the journalist, uh, Duncan Campbell, goes there. He pulls thousands and thousands of records, and there's some mystique about what exactly he did. There's some thinking he took a lot more than that even. We don't know. All we know is when he left, he had 10 or 11,000 records. He... Um, back when there were modems and faxes and he he sent that to the 10 journalists on on planet earth on six continents and uh, the british american tobacco executives on all the continents had um been very careful and never once used the spanish word for smuggle except mm -hmm. in one place in in uh, brazil and and another country uh, in the area there in northern part of south america and it was a journalist there who um, discovered they had not disguised in the BAT documents, inside company documents, they, they, they actually used the smuggle word and they, they basically acknowledged it by the use of that word, what they were doing. They were using third party cutouts in places like Aruba, people that smuggle guns, you name it, anything, drugs, guns, I don't care. And yes, they were also doing tobacco that had not been otherwise sold and they were avoiding customs duties saving billions of dollars in taxes on planet earth not just south america and yeah. smuggling globally not just in south america but anyway that document is what we used for that report and it went viral like within minutes around the world and criminal prosecutions were or criminal investigations yeah. were announced in brazil argentina and britain so the process was that a journalist in colombia saw it and uh they, uh, the, we all cons we basically protected the person's name because we were afraid that journalists would be in, at risk, which I think wasn't crazy. I think it, it's possible that would have, would have happened. So anyway, that's a case of everyone looking and one person being able to see something and having something. No one, no one else spoke Spanish of the ten yeah. journalists, and this person did. And uh, it's a pretty great. It was a great illustrative uh, example of what the what's possible with a collaboration. It's really, and it was actually the first investigation, which is even better. Um, and from that moment on, it was lookout world. Thank you so much for your time and for Excellent. sharing all your experience and thoughts. And um, yeah, I'm really grateful. Oh, well, sure. Good luck with what you're doing. I mean, I hope it, uh, if there's any way to stay in touch or let me know how it turns out, I, I'm very interested in what you're doing. I think it's really important. Uh, you are trying to do something in a systematic, thoughtful, uh, international way uh, and, and kind of lay out a template for how things ought to be done when, as far as I can tell, almost no one has attempted that or succeeded in doing it. So I'm wishing you well.